All right, we're starting up. Sorry, guys. Just a uh, problem with Wirecast, as always. Guess I have to update it here pretty soon. But I'm going to be ready for this show shortly. I got to get my glasses. That's one thing I need. I forgot I didn't have on my face. All right, I'm back. I couldn't find my glasses for like the longest time. Uh, and I haven't set up quite everything yet. Need to get on uh, YouTube, I guess. Let's see. Make sure I'm actually streaming right now. Oh no, why? Why is it called War Eternus? That is so annoying. What's up, Phantom Kaiju? Thanks for showing up. Uh, I'm just gonna pop this chat out so I can see what you guys are seeing and also see what people are saying on Twitch. I gotta make sure my computer's muted too. Nope, no, no, no. Shut up. There we go. How do I pop the chat out now? Crap. I guess I'll just have to go back and forth here. Where to go? There we go. Okay. So, let's go ahead and switch this over. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Sound Booth Theater Live. Requests only. Um, we got we got a pretty short show today. I think probably, hopefully, just an hour. I'm kind of, I'm still not back into the loop or, or into the uh, into the groove since getting back from Thailand. Uh, yeah, check out this shirt. This is textured too. It's a, it's a cool. It's one thing about Thailand is it's incredibly tacky, like endearingly so. Um, everything's just ridiculous bright colors. Com everything completely overdone that you know that actually can be done. They just kind of like scatter icons everywhere. Like there's no rhyme or reason to anything that they that they decorate with it just like how big and how colorful and how crazy can we get at, at least the stuff that they put the effort into they just go all in so our three requests today um, one of them was 
was a song. And I'll be singing that shortly. And it's going to be... And the so song's going to be pretty short compared to anything else I, I would actually read on the show. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm going to do it right because it's like an adaptation of a poem in the style of Piano Man by Billy Joel. Um, so I'm going to have to mess with it a little bit to get it to work right or do my very best. And I won't have any like accompanying music, but I will do my best because it was requested and voted on. Okay, so I got to find the script. I actually kind of wanted to put it on here. Let me see if I can do that. I think I, did I just download it? Yeah, I just downloaded it. What's it called? Let's say 26734. There we go. Oh, I forgot to uh, make, sorry guys. Just a, just a moment. Man, that's a little too small. Uh, maybe you guys can. Testing, testing. There we go. It's on now. Why would that turn off? That's so annoying. Okay, sorry guys. Let me say everything again. What a disaster today has been. Okay, so uh, the song that I'm going to sing, it, let's see, I'll go back to it. The technical difficulties are real indeed. Um, Nemesis, <coughs> excuse me, by H.P. Lovecraft. Um... Nicholas Legrand wanted me to 
wanted me to sing this one in the to the tune of Billy Joel's Piano Man. So that's going to be at the end of the night. Um, but thank you for requesting that. That's going to be that's going to be fun. He uh, someone uh, J- Justin James posted someone who actually like produced a version of it of doing just this. So it kind of ruined it for me a little bit. But for anyone who didn't look at that, you'll you'll hear my version later tonight. And too bad I don't have any like accompanying music. Um, but I'll do my best. Okay, so Halcyon Rising is what's up, and uh, this is like um. This is a, from what I can understand, a lit RPG, uh, sort of, um, harem thing going on. Very popular thing to see in lit RPG, and for good reason, I think. Uh, it's just a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, but let's see. Let me see if I can find it in my email, because whenever people make requests, they usually send it to my email. Uh, the specific part they want me to read, anyway. And I think this was this was requested a while back. This is maybe the third or fourth. Yeah, here we go. This is maybe the third or fourth um, poll it's been through. But finally, it made it to the top. And I'm kind of excited to read it. I, I, I was intrigued by looking at it when I first saw it on Amazon. And it's I think it's still doing really well, by the way. I think it's still in the sixth, the top <coughs> 6,000 on, um, on the Kindle market, even though it's been out for a few months now. Um, so kudos Stone Thomas for writing a successful novel here. Um, anyway, here, well, I'll read the, uh, the instructions here, the direction. This excerpt is chapter two and a bit of chapter three. The book is written in the first person as Arden, a human male in his late teens. He's just an average guy. He was taken in by a local temple as a young orphan and worked as a custodian there his whole life. When the city and the temple are attacked, he flees and finds a goddess inside a crystal cocoon. That goddess, Nola, is the character in this scene. She's a young goddess, full of energy and excitement to use her godly powers. She's not necessarily patient, but she's good-natured about any gentle ribbing when it comes to Arden and other people that show up her temple, to her temple. Other names that come up. Lauren, Larange, like pronouncing the orange in French, Lorange. Oh, Lorange, okay. Like, uh, Henato Lorange. Uh, I hope you guys know who that is. Uh... Zazara and Duel are the two other characters. Khan, like Khan, or okay. And all right, so here goes Halcyon Rising, Breaking Ground by Stone Thomas. I'm kind of excited to read this one. And here's my alcohol endorsement for the day. Little known fact in VO: the best thing for your voice is a ton of alcohol. Like, constantly. Anyone For any, anyone who wants to go pro, that's the secret. Halcyon Rising, Breaking Ground, by Stone Thomas. All right. Uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn myself into a late teen. 19? 18, 19? The giant looked at me with large, waxy eyes. Its mandibles were two sharp fangs that jutted from its lower jaw. It poked me again with one of its l- it poked me again with one of its six legs as I pushed back with my feet and yelled. I had never been that close to a giant's <coughs> giant. That changes the whole thing. Let me start again. The giant looked at me with large, waxy eyes. Its mandibles were two sharp fangs that jutted from its lower jaw. It poked me again with one of its six legs as I pushed back with my feet and yelled. I had never been that close to a giant insect's mouth before. I never wanted to be again. The monster reared on its hind legs and twitched its antenna. I realized then that two other giants were behind me. Giants were behind me. They were communicating with each other somehow. This guy looks tasty, I imagined them saying and he's already salted himself with sweat. Yum. I brought... He's a, he's a little too excited about that, right? Let me try that again. This guy looks salty, I imagined them saying, and he's already salted himself with s- sweat. Tasty. This guy looks tasty. Yum. I brought my weapon up and knocked the giant over. That wasn't, a, that wasn't a, any better performance, by the way. 
just moving on. It landed on its back and twitched its legs as it tried to right itself. The other two creatures came toward me at impressive speed, convincing me that running away was not an option. Come and get me! I yelled. I was pretty sure they were going to do that anyway, but watching them follow my command made me feel powerful, if only for a second. The first ant neared, and I stabbed it in the face with my spear. It let out a high-pitched sound that must have been a scream. I yanked... I yanked my weapon away and stabbed toward the second one. It dodged my attack, then leapt at me. It landed on my chest, pinning me against the ground under its weight. It sank its mouth into my shoulder, digging into my muscle. I slid my spear under its body and thrust up with both hands, forcing the monster off of me. It flew into the other giant and was... It's, uh, it flew into the, <laughs> it flew into the other giant and was slowed for a moment in a tangle of giant legs. I took that opportunity to stab my spear through both creatures at once. What's up? What's up, Danny? They bucked and writhed against each other and against my pole. But soon their struggle ended. <laughs> Is this turning into cringe theater? I had, I had killed them both. The first ant that had poked me in the back was skittering away now. <laughs> it must have gotten back on its feet and realized what a terrifying warrior I was. Or it was going to ask its older brother to come beat me up, which seemed more likely. I decided to put a stop to that. I chased after the insect as it sprinted through the forest, dodging trees and thorny bushes. It leapt over a fallen log then used its hind legs to kick the log backward at me. The rotten wood exploded in a cloud of moldy wood chips and termites. I brushed the creepers off of me as I ran, keeping the giant in my sights. I chased the insect down a flat path with the slopes of a hill rising on either side, as if someone had leveled this stretch of the land and left the surrounding hill intact. Ahead, there was a dead end with a wall of exposed rock. Before long, it was clear that the monster had chosen this dead end on purpose. It was indeed going for help, not just from one older brother, but from a whole team of them. A series of six giants carried a large white cocoon on their skulls from, ar from an archway in the rock that led to a cave. They dropped it when I arrived. Combined, I said, the seven of you have thirty-eight more limbs than I do, so you should at least let me strike first. No dice. All seven insects charged at once. I waited for them to get closer, then dropped to a crouch and swung my spear across the ground. All seven giants tripped and tumbled as my masterfully, as my masterful sweeping arc toppled them over simultaneously. That's what happened in my mind's eye. In real life, the pole smacked into the first one's leg, then stopped moving. I wasn't strong enough to trip them. I let go of my weapon and jumped forward. I landed on one's back, then another as I ran across their hard carapaces like stepping stones. They squealed underneath me, but didn't seem injured. I... I was, about to... I was about to run past the white cocoon and into the cave for shelter, but something about the enormous white structure caught my eye and slowed me down. The cocoon wasn't the milky white silk of a monster bug. Its surface was a series of flat, semi-transparent panels that tapered to a point at each end. And there was a woman inside, trapped in crystal. Uh-oh, here comes the ladies. Their teeth are caught on their clothing. No, wait. In my distraction, a giant caught up with me and grabbed my leg. Then another one. I punched and kicked, but I couldn't break free. Their teeth are caught on the clothing. I wasn't sure where that thought came from, but it had a point. I had ant creatures all over my body, but they hadn't sunk their fangs into my skin yet. I pulled off my blue cotton shirt and threw it on the ground. The giants couldn't get themselves free of it. Their sharp fangs were too entangled. Next, I pulled off my pants. I wasn't sure where... No, the fang end of those creatures' faces did scrape the skin of my leg, opening a long, bloody scratch, but otherwise I was fine. The ants were stuck in a tug of war with each other over my clothing. I ran back for my spear and started stabbing each creature in the back. One by one, they stopped moving as I eradicated them from this life. Arden the Exterminator, back at it again. As a result, however, 
My clothing tore to shreds as the giants fought over my shirt and pants. It felt empowering in a strangely barbaric way to stand here, buck naked, spearing my enemies to death. But now it was time to put my clothes back on. I tossed the lifeless bodies of the ants to the side. My shirt was salvageable, my pants held up, though they had holes in the knees now. Not fashionable at all. I turned... Oops. Sorry. I turned toward the cocoon, lying on the ground and containing a woman with her arms crossed on her chest, the transparent material encasing her clouded with the transparent material encasing her clouded when it got toward her waist. The only window was on the upper half of her body. Kneeling beside this curious find, I stared at the woman within. She practically radiated with soft yellow light. Her lips were full, her eyelashes long. A heart-shaped face tapered to a point at her chin. Then her eyes opened, and I fell backward. The blood rushed to my face. I had been caught staring. Not cool, Arden, I thought. The woman inside that crystal sarf sarcophagus pressed against the upper edge of it and sat up. Her body moved th through that barrier as if it were nothing. Maybe it was nothing. Maybe I was imagining all of this. She looked over at me and lowered her arms. Her breasts were bare. She didn't bother to pull her long brown hair forward to hide them. I cast my eyes to the side. Oh, shoot, she said. I always embarrass mortals like this. I keep forgetting how prudish you all are. I'm, uh, not prudish, I said. At least, I don't think I am. I don't have any clothing at all, she said. Clothes are stifling enough on a normal day, but today I'm trying to evolve. I definitely don't want clothes in the way. Um, okay, I said. I'm Nola, the goddess of clever insight, she said. I'm pretty excited my tip about... I'm pretty excited my tip about the big ants on your clothing helped. I'm not always fast enough to send thoughts when they're useful. That was you? I asked. Inside my head? Yep, she said. It takes me a while to break out of my crystal chrysalis, so my best bet was to hope you killed those insects before they dragged me away. Thanks for the assist. Show us your junk, goddess. <laughs> That's funny, you guys. You guys are so silly. Uh, they bucked against my pole at <laughs> Jeff 2018. <coughs> That's from the YouTube comments, by the way. Nola, not Noah. I have questions, I said. This has been a very strange day. Oh? She asked. She was still sitting with her lower half encased in her crystal, but pivoted from the waist to look around. Then she closed her eyes. Her whole body glowed with that gentle yellow light. Then her eyes shot open again, and she screamed. I covered my ears until she stopped. Larange is dead. Larange is dead, she said, and Bilfer, and Cesara. I'm from Meadowdale, I said. I used to work in Larange's temple. I was there when it happened. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, guys. You're not her head priest, are you? Nola asked. No, I said, just an errand boy. I need to evolve as quickly as possible, Nola said. Duel has finally risen, and if we don't work together now, the Pantheon will be destroyed. I could use a little backstory here if you wouldn't mind, I said. Of course, she said. Duel is the god of war. Long, long ago, well before I was born, because I'm still very young for a lower deity, Duel ruled over this world. He stoked the flames of ire and enmity forcing men and elf and beastkin to battle in an endless cycle of death and destruction. The more of the world engaged in war, the stronger he became. Excuse me. Ugandan Knuckles needs to make an appearance. That would be great. Slowly, he destroyed everything the Great Mother had built. The humans built bombs to blow holes in the mountains. The elves crafted spells to kill the living and raise the dead. 
The beastkins started eating the other races. It was pandemonium. Back then, all of the gods ruled their separate s- ruled their separate spheres and stayed out of each other's business. The Great Mother changed that. She rallied the gods and goddesses together and stripped Duel of most of his power. He remained the god of war, but he could barely manage to cause a fight between husband and wife, let alone between kingdoms and empires. I have a psychic connection to the family of the gods. Duel has been quiet. Some of us thought he had finally accepted his fate, but others thought he was biding his time, storing up his godly energy until he had enough to launch a war again. I never dreamed it would come to this, though. He not only reignited mankind's passion for blood, he has declared war on the gods themselves. He's killing minor deities now and absorbing their light to feed his own. (coughs) (coughs) He's casting a curse on the men of... He's casting a curse on the men of the free cities and probably the other settled regions soon to turn their hearts black with a lust for war. I can't pry yet into his designs on on the women he's left behind. I can't pry yet into his designs on the women he's left behind. I feel the death wounds of my brother and sister gods. I hear the words they cried as their energy was taken from them. It's agonizing. Larange was like me a young goddess with the potential to grow and take on more roles as she evolved. Now she'll never have that chance. And that means Duel might come for you too, I said. Yes, which is why I must evolve as quickly as possible. I'm certainly not strong enough to stand against him as I am. My powers are subdued when I'm in my chrysalis, so I'll need a chosen one to protect me. Say, what's your name? Arden, I said. Arden, Nola repeated. You are the chosen one. Me? I asked. An orphan, berated by a heartless priest, shut up in a temple tower for my whole life. No family, no friends. How could I be the one? Yes, Nola said. You're the only one around, so there's so there aren't many to choose from. I choose you. That makes you chosen. She added some dramatic flourish at the end, but her words made it clear. I was chosen out of necessity, not by prophecy. Still, I take what I could get. What does a chosen one do? I asked. Keep me safe, she said. And maybe spruce this place up a bit? The giants knocked down the door to my temple when they came to kidnap me, so things look a little unprofessional right now. No one's going to come pay me homage if this place is a wreck. How often do people pay you homage? I asked. Okay, Mr. Smart Guy, she said. Never. But if I had a nice temple, that sort of thing might change. And a head priest. What kind of a temple doesn't have a head priest? I asked. The kind that's really an empty cave so far, she confessed. Look, I'm real new at this, but the one thing I can do is make you my head priest. It's an honorific tide. It's an honorific title that has a few perks, like like opening the skill mi- like opening the skillmeister skill. I said. So that you know about, but not the names of the pantheon's most important gods. I don't know what to assume with you. Oh, wait. So that you know about, but not the names of the Pantheon's most important gods. I don't know what to assume with you. I'll do it, I said. I'll be your head priest. Good, Nola said. When visitors finally come, tell them that you serve Nola, the goddess of clever insight, bestower of ideas never too small, who inspires the creative thoughts you experience as you lay in bed, hoping instead to sleep. Wait. I said. Are you a good god or an evil one? She sighed. I'd like to give people ideas at more opportune times, but my powers are limited. People, perhaps when I evolve, I can serve as a more con- Perhaps when I evolve, I can serve as a more convenient muse. Until then, ideas before falling asleep are better than nothing. And besides, that's not all I do. Now, she said. Drag me back inside. Nola sank back inside her crystal and folded her arms over her chest. Now that her nipples weren't showing, 
I felt less self-conscious about glancing at her. Once I dragged her crystal inside the cave, it floated of its own accord. She perched, hovering in the air, above a stone slab altar. Two stone bowls, one on each side, sat with no fire in them. The light from outside was barely enough to see by, but I assumed those were torch pits in need of a flame. Head Priest Arden. Oh, Head... <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Head Priest Arden. She spoke inside my mind. That was creepy as hell. It would definitely take some getting used to. Speak these words to pledge your fealty to me and accept your new role. I, Arden... I, Arden, I said, do take this post, do take this post, freely, despite the risks. What risks? We're about to create a psychic bond, which sometimes goes wrong. You might end up insane or brain, you might end up insane or brain dead. Or you could, or you could become a skillmeister. Probably the latter. I wondered, after the things I thought I saw so far this day, if I hadn't already gone insane. If so, there wasn't much to lose if this went wrong. <sighs> Freely, despite the risks. A second went by. Then another one. Then my mind lit up like a house on fire. Pain seared through every nerve. I had flashes of memories that I thought were long forgotten playing with the other children from the orphanage, getting sc scolded by Khan for taking bread from the temple kitchen when I hadn't eaten in days, being laughed at by a beautiful girl who came to the temple to pray and said I was too dirty and too ugly for her to bother looking at, let alone speak to. <coughs> I cried, but not for those memories. Those memories had toughened me up. No, I cried because this hurt like getting hit in the balls with a sledgehammer, but in this case, my balls were inside my head and my brain was screaming in a high-pitched voice. Now you will never have children! Actually, forget children, you will never even have thoughts again! You, sir, are a potato and a mental eunuch! Today I learned, just because a girl is pretty doesn't mean you should let her inside your head. When the pain finally subsided, I slumped to the floor, completely spent. I can't speak to you like this easily when you stray from the temple, Nola said. But when you are near, I'll try to give you clever ideas that will help you do your job. For instance, did you know that if you get a health potion and freeze it, it will make a rejuvenating ice pop during the hot summer months? I'm full of tips like that. Nola, holy deliverer of life hacks. My breathing was still heavy from the ordeal I went through. Well, go ahead. Try your new skill. And that's it. So that was Halcyon Rising Breaking Ground by Stone Thomas. I'm actually kind of intrigued by that. Um, it's an interesting idea. I think I think that the writing is a little... Um, a little too on the nose, maybe, for my taste. But other than that, I think it has some, some real promise. So thank you, Stone Thomas, or whoever... Um, and or whoever requested Stone Thomas's uh, Halcyon Rising for allowing me to read your book on Sound Booth Theater Live requests only. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. It's on Amazon.com right now. I don't know, but it might already have the sequel out. Let me check that. Doopy-doopy-doo, doopy-doo. Nope, not yet. But, let's see. No, there's no book to pre-order or anything. I imagine he'll have something out soon, though. Rejuvenating ice pops. I like that idea. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, that's her character. She's the she's the uh, Skyrim blurbs during loader sc loading screens. 
Truffle, how dare you be late? It's okay, I forgive you. Oops. This thing is in the way. Oh, well. No, that's not what I want to do. This way, okay. You'll have to catch the replay, indeed. Okay, so... Next... Is... My choice, which was Blackjack Villain by Ben Bicker. I don't know how to pronounce that. Oh, um, I also got a PDF of this one. Um, and this was requested probably three or four weeks ago, ago as well. Um, this one isn't a lit RPG, as far as I know, but it is a superhero. <clears throat> you did not miss Piano Man, no worries. Excuse me. This is a superhero story, um, or a supervillain story. Uh, it's got a lot of great reviews on Amazon, so go check that out. I don't think it has an audio version yet. Excuse me. Okay. So it looks like the the author actually did give us a um, little note here. Alright, below is the sampler for you guys to have fun with. It's the opening from Blackjack Villain and probably the most fun I've had writing since I started. The characters are simple. It's Blackjack himself. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, guys. A misaligned, misanthropic villain caught by surprise in his lair by his book one nemesis, Atmosphero. Atmo is a big-time hero, famous and beloved, and he thinks he's fighting a far inferior villain, making him arrogant and careless. In their first fight, he has an ace up his sleeve that helps him against Blackjack. In a later conflict between them, our lovable villain, villain figures it out. I hope you, Jeff Hayes, and your audience enjoy this, and if you can, send me a link to the finished recording. I'm totally geeking out. Thanks, Ben. All right. Cool. So it sounds like he's excited to see this. I hope that we can get this to him as soon as, as soon as we, as soon as it's over. Um, okay. So here goes. There's no real descriptions. <coughs> Not well. There's a little bit. <coughs> so for Blackjack villain, I'm going to. I'm gonna go with my sort of Duke Nukem voice. This ought to be fun. Blackjack, villain. Prologue. I sensed him well before I could see him. A man in my line of business learns to respect every random anxious feeling, or he doesn't last long. This guy had the subtlety of a Category 5 hurricane. He also had powers and an ego to match. No sooner had I come out onto the balcony of my Malibu home to take in the sunset and down a cold beer... Then the entire landscape changed. It transformed from the warm purple and orange to darkness, swept through by shadows, as a storm front moved in too fast to be a natural occurrence. The slight breeze became a gale, and the clouds above coalesced into the outline of a cruel, smiling face, eyes illuminated with white-yellow lighting. I dropped my beer and threw myself through the sliding glass door as the first crackle of lightning tore into the balcony, imploding with a cloud of wood and glass. I flew through the air like a rag doll flung by an angry child, spearing through a wall into the kitchen and coming to a rest atop the shattered remains of the center island. The air crackled electrostatically, and my lungs burned as every breath felt like a surge of wafting energy. I came to my feet and glanced over my shoulders through the wrecked wall at the wide chasm that lay beyond the smoldering balcony. <coughs> I shook the glass and dusted off my face and noticed the hairs of, no I shook the glass and dust off my face and noticed the hairs of my arms standing on end as he entered, carried aloft by his godlike powers. After looking around, he settled his stern gaze upon me. I blinked my vision clear, but the world still had a bright white tinge. It illuminated him like an angel as he touched down to the remains of my living room. He was tall and powerful, wearing ridiculous blue and yellow tights. He called himself Atmosphero. Yes, Atmosphero. My real name is Dale McCown, but I'm known as... 
Blackjack, he said. Fancy meeting you here. I should have jumped out of the way. Maybe I did, but he was faster, lancing his, lancing his horrible powers at me through the hole in the wall, raw lightning crackling through my body. I screamed, overcome with rage, impotence, and pain, as I watched him destroy the remnants of the wall in front of me and shatter the entire kitchen around me. Light exploded through my closed eyelids and into the back of my mind, and I thought bitterly, sorry about that, and I thought bitterly of the sunset I enjoyed a minute before. A gust of wind lifted me off the ground, like an overgrown marionette, as lightning racked my body like a thousand pulled muscles and tendons all at once. He cackled, reveling in his power, tossing me across the room. I careened into the dual steel refrigerators, destroying them and bathing in their contents as I fell to the floor. Caked in milk, juice, and egg, I was momentarily out of sight, and that was only and that was the only chance I needed. Because Atmosphero wasn't the only one in the room with superpowers. He was hidden by what remained of the wall between my living room and kitchen, but I could feel where he was and imagined him strolling forward casually to finish me off. I buried my dislike for the peacock and flung a massive piece of marble through the wall. It was effortless, like throwing a frisbee. The former countertop tore through drywall and stud sand I... Stout. The former countertop tore through drywall and... St and studs, and I laughed. Uh, the former countertop tore through drywall and studs, and I laughed, thinking I had him. Hopping through the wide hole, I saw him standing there, unharmed, the marble countertop floating in the air a few feet from him. His mocking smile dripped with disgust, as if he expected more of a challenge from me. He flung the countertop back at me, but I intercepted it with a punch, detonating it into a hailstorm of marble fragments. I rushed forward, but he took to the air to avoid me. My hair stood on end as he charged up again. Come down here, asshole! I roared, and let me have and let me give you a proper welcome. I was bigger than he was, bigger than most people, and a lot stronger. I usually depended on my bow and trick arrows, but in a straight up fight I could crush him. Ah, oh, are you mad I beat you so easily last time? Oh wait. I taunted. Aw, are you mad I beat you so easily last time? I taunted, hoping he'd get reckless and rush me. But despite our growing grudge, he was a pro. Atmosphero was going to fight me on his terms. Damn, man, that's rough. He chuckled, glancing around. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. He chuckled, glancing around my shattered house. I guess no subletting this one. But don't worry, the walls in San Quentin are a bit sturdier. I rushed him, but he was quicker. My fingertips almost latched onto his cape as he flipped over me and flung a powerful charge of wind that heaved me out of the house through the damaged balcony and down the rocky Malibu hill. I crushed down the cliff through rock, brush, and dirt, bouncing a half dozen times until I came to a rest on the soft hands of the beach two hundred feet below my home. Oh, I crashed down the cliff through rock. <clears throat> Bruised and battered, I came to my unsteady feet and looked up, half expecting the next bolt of lightning from Atmosphero. Instead, he hovered over my home, looking down at me. Maybe he was surprised I was still on my feet, or perhaps he was unsure what to do next, but he got an idea fast. Atmosphero summoned up his storm powers with a wide cast of his hands. A tornado then formed beneath and around my house, producing a great howl of wind and sand that ripped the structure from its foundation, piping and wooden struts, and lifted the whole thing into the air. Then he hurled it at me. It came so fast, a whole house hurtling headlong at me, that I had no way to avoid it, nowhere to go. I could only chortle before the house crushed me. The sheer weight of the tons of concrete and masonry forced me down, collapsing atop me and burying me deep in the sand. The crashing sound was deafening, a disharmonious mix of exploding wood, shattering glass and twisting metal. But I lived, and I started to dig myself out. 
Atmosphero helped, noticing the movement in the wreckage and wanting to finish me once and for all. He lifted a whole wall section off me, casting it aside. Still stuck under some of the structure, I could see him floating above and feel the rush of his wind powers lifting whole pieces of the de devastated house. Above me lay, lay the bent and twisted remains of the garage door, and when he flung it away, I struck, throwing one of the destroyed refrigerators at him. Though, how the fridge ended up in what was essentially my garage, I'll never know. It caught him by surprise, slamming into his chest and knocking him over, pinning him long enough for me to reach him. I picked up the fridge and lifted it off his stunned and bloodied form. His eyes were filled with a mixture of rage and fear. Hey, asshole, I said. Thanks for fucking up my house. Now I'm going to fuck up your face! I slammed the heavy fridge down with my full strength back on him. I lifted it and pounded him once more with the battered fridge, pulverizing the wobbly aluminum and plastic frame. Aluminum and plastic frame. Now it was my turn to rip through pieces of metal to get to him. And his turn to surprise me. Atmosphero whipped the remains of the refrigerator into me with his wind powers, sending me reeling a few paces. At the same time, he came to his feet and summoned a vortex of wind that spun around us, whipping up shreds and pieces of the destroyed home like a wall of metallic and wooden death. Excuse me. Time for you to learn a valuable lesson, he said, spitting blood. Atmosphero slugged me across the face with more strength than I had imagined he had, but this was what I wanted to wanted. A stand-up fight. The only problem was that my body didn't cooperate. My arms were heavy and useless, pinned to my sides, and I stood there, semi-paralyzed, as he powered fist after fist into my face. I couldn't focus my thoughts, let alone do anything. I could barely stand. He unleashed his full fury, and the pain of each blow was intense. I staggered backward a few steps, then fell onto my knees, receiving more and more punishment, blow after pummeling blow. The rub is that he'd get away the rub is that he'd get away with it. Because he was the hero, and I was the scumbag villain. Alright. So that's Blackjack. Thanks again, Ben Becker. Becker? Ben Becker? I don't know how to pronounce your last name, I'm sorry. It's very sophisticatedly spelt. But uh, thank you for allowing us to read Blackjack Villain uh, on Sound Booth Theater Live. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. So, uh, yeah, check it out on Amazon.com. It's I think it came out in 2014, maybe? Let me look it up. Um, let's see, came out in 2012, and I think it did really well back then, so, it's a three-book series, so if you liked this, there's plenty of material there, um, so go check it out on Amazon. And that's it for our audiobook requests, and now, a little bit of singing. Uh, I'll apologize to you guys in advance for my singing, um, I'm still a little bit sick, I have been like, I've been sick for like a month and a half. <laughs> and it's it's still I'm still trying to work out this cough, but I'll do my best uh, trying to read this Lovecraft uh, Billy Joel mashup. So here goes. Uh, now it says that it has the same meter, but I don't remember there being like a third. <coughs> A third um, line to the stanza like this. It's uh, it's like da 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 I don't know what I'll do with this. I think what I'll do is I'll read these first two v verses. And then I'll do this as like a... <coughs> and 
as a sort of chorus type thing. I drifted the seas without ending. All right, so I'm just gonna try it out, uh, and this is this is gonna be our sign off. So, everybody, thank you for uh, coming and hanging out with me on SBTL, the first one of the year, as far as I'm concerned, uh, as as far as my stuff. Uh, actually, the very first Sound Booth Theater Live this year was um, <coughs> Justin James and Lori Catherine Winkle uh, reading from Pangea Online, Death and Axes. Um, that's gonna be coming out in the next couple months. Um, and that's Justin leading that project, so thank you, Justin, for uh, taking the lead on that, and um, I'm sure he's going to make a wonderful audiobook. We, we, just need to, uh, we just need to edit it together and get it ready for publication. Um, but, yeah, so check that out. It's not actually on the Soundbooth Theater Live YouTube channel. It's on Justin James's YouTube channel. But just uh, search for that. S search for Pangea online. I'm sure you'll f you'll find <coughs> their stream, their little sound booth theater live on Justin's channel. So and be sure to subscribe to him once you go check it out as well. If you haven't subscribed to Sound Booth Theater Live, if you haven't joined the Facebook group, um, please please do that. Uh, that. That helps our numbers. It helps us reach more people. And please share this video if you like it. All right. And sorry again. There's no. A musical accompaniment. <clears throat> through the, through, I gotta find the key. Through the, through the ghoul-guarded gateways of a, of slumber. Is that it? Uh, I better look at a better version of this. I'm look, here we go. Through the ghoul-guarded gateways of slumber. Past the wan mooned abysses of night. I have lived o'er my lives without number. I have sounded all things with my sight. And I struggle and shriek ere the daybreak, being driven to madness with fright. I have whirled with the earth at the dawning, when the sky was a vaporous flame. I have seen the dark universe yawning, where the black planets roll without aim, where they roll in their horror unheeded, without knowledge or luster or name. I had drifted o'er seas without ending, under sinister gray-clouded skies, that the many-forked lightning is rending, that resound with hysterical cries, with the moans of invisible demons, that out of the green waters rise. I have plunged like a deer through the arches of the hoary primordial grove, where the oaks feel the presence that marches, and stalks on where no spirits dare rove. Oops. And I flee from a thing that surrounds me, and leers through dead branches above. I had drifted o'er seas without ending, I always fuck that up, under sinister gray-clouded skies, that the many-forked lightning is rending, that resound with hysterical cries. With the moans of invisible demons That out of the green waters rise <laughs> Okay, so that's that's that, guys. That's the... the uh, there's only four stanzas here. I think that, that it's... Uh, that it's a little... Sh I think there's more to it than that. But that's that's all that's in, in the picture that he sent. He requested that, not the whole thing. So there you go, Nicholas Legrand. Uh, thank you for requesting that. It was, it was kind of fun. Um, and I forced myself to get out of my range here. I don't know. I did okay, maybe. Uh, thanks for watching, guys. Uh, thanks for hanging out. And that's Sound Booth Theater Live for you. Uh, I plan to do another one next Sunday. We'll see. Uh, I'll, I'll have that a tentative thing. But I also, sometime this week, uh, I want to do another Sound Booth Theater Live um, for Greystone Chronicles, because I need to do all the character voices for that book. Car uh, Lori's already done narrating the whole thing, so <coughs> to all of you guys who are looking forward to uh, the Greystone Chronicles coming out on audio, it's going to be soon. It's going to be very soon. A month, 
I think maybe a month. No, no, it's it, no, l yeah, probably a month. Um, <clears throat> so thanks, um, thanks again so much, you guys, for coming and hanging out. And please share, please subscribe, and uh, yeah, do whatever you can to support the show. Um, newest audiobooks out, by the way, which is Concern, narrated by Laurie Catherine Winkle as well. And me backing it up with all the uh, all the male voices. We also have Hellions, Paragons Online or Sigil Online too, um, and those those are the two that came out already. Uh, and Dungeon Lord is going to be coming out any minute now, so be on the lookout for that. Also, War Eternus is getting is getting sent to the publishers tomorrow, so we have so much great stuff on the way. And um, if anything, just go ahead and check out, you know, search my name on Audible, and you'll find plenty of great lit RPG and other sci-fi and fantasy audiobooks.